Okay, I'm Amanda Hess. Um, I write about internet culture for the New York Times, and I am really happy to be here with a bunch of lovely panelists who are talking about this kind of less than lovely political moment. Um, they're going to talk about men, about white men, <laughs> and uh, about populism and data and stuff like that. Um, so, unfortunately, Jess Maddox could not be here. She got stuck in Atlanta with like a terrible storm. So, um, pray for Jess. Um, but we do have Sarah Lilla. Lillo? Sorry. Man, I had one job. Sarah Lillo is a PhD student at Boston University focusing on inequality, gender, and the digital world. Josie Nummy? Fuck. Josie Numi <laughs> is pursuing her PhD in sociology at Texas A&M University. Her research interests include intersectionality, social media, and social movements, along with systemic racism. And Brian Justy researches <laughs> aesthetics and technology at New York University. I want to note that Brian had a really great font that is not going to appear on his thing, so just imagine it's a better font. Okay, we're going to start with Sarah. All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Sarah Lillo. I'm from Boston University, and my presentation is titled Digital Masculinities and the 2016 Election. So when we think about the 2016 election culturally, uh, we think about nasty women, bad hombres, and deplorables, and how these ended up in our profile names, in our hashtags, in memes. Uh, we think about a wide variety of Twitter drama and um, some memorable moments, like when Hillary tweeted, delete your account, or when Donald Trump told us to check out a sex tape at 5.30 in the morning. Um, so while we debated, celebrated, purchased, tweeted the loudest moments of this election, cultural meanings were quietly being produced daily in the form of images. And one of these meanings, given the fact that we had our first woman presidential nominee of a major party was gender, how we value and evaluate gender in America. And uh, it wasn't just a conversation about what it means to be a powerful woman. We also talked a lot about what it means to be a man. So unsurprisingly, gendered messages were rampant in the images politicians employed to create digital versions of themselves. So... Focusing on masculinity, um, this presentation explores gendered messages in the Instagram images of Clinton, Trump, Pence, and Kane. Um, in doing so, I ask, how is masculinity constructed visually in the digital spaces of the 2016 election? What narratives of gender did these otherwise unremarkable images create? So some quick background on gender. Gender theory identifies a range of ways we can measure what's called uh, hegemonic masculinity, which is the dominant form of masculinity in society. Um, while there's no right way to be a man, we can identify certain traits that society rewards more than others. So these include physical traits, such as being tall or having big muscles, um, behavioral traits, such as suppressing emotion around friends or interacting more with other men in the workplace than women and um, social markers as well are uh, connected with hegemonic masculinity such as whiteness and heterosexuality. I drew from these ideas of hegemonic masculinity as I looked at politicians' Instagram images to see what kind of uh, image of masculinity they constructed. And I did this based on the idea that media images don't just document the real world. They sort of create a world of their own. Uh, media scholar John Fisk wrote of traditional media, in a postmodern world, we can no longer rely on a stable relationship or clear distinction between a real event and its mediated representation. Consequently, we can no longer work with the idea that the real is more important, significant, or even true than the representation. Media events have their own reality. As with traditional media, social media not only depict public figures but produce them, with visual images blurring the lines between representation and reality. Social media accounts 
are mediated representations of our lives, creating narratives that may or may not exist in our behaviors in the physical world. They are no less real, yet the distinction between the two matters, especially when we think about narratives created with political intent. So to explore the narratives of the 2016 election for this project, I looked through over 1,700 Instagram images to get a sense of what stories were being told. And then based on the patterns I found, I created a smaller sample of 80 pictures to explore in more depth. What I found was that each account did, in fact, tell a different story of masculinity. Trump's images highlighted bodies. So through photographs of female family members and celebrities, typically norm normatively attractive women, Trump's masculinity is intensified by its contrast to feminine bodies. So just as there are qualities of men that society rewards more than others, there's a corresponding set of traits that we associate with normative feminine beauty. And we see this in Trump's repetitive imagery of tall, thin, often white women with long hair and tight dresses, and a look generally uh, achieved through gender-enhancing beauty products and services reserved for the wealthy. Uh, now Trump, uh, purely on, on his own, visually, might not look like the most ideal picture of masculinity, <laughs> but he's white, he's tall, and his gender presentation is squarely in the normative category, so he, he dresses the way society expects a man to dress. Um, so he's not far off. Uh, but then position him next to beauty pageant winners, Ivanka, Melania, and what happens here is we see one of the key markers of masculinity that men learn as children, being a boy means not being a girl. When gender is defined relationally in this way, uh, the sharper the visual difference between a man and a woman, uh, the more pronounced their masculinity or femininity becomes. As a result, Trump's frequent pictures with hyper-feminine women, by contrast, builds the digital image of Trump as a hyper-masculine man. Uh, Pence's images placed him in the category of a different type of masculinity, this one highlighting industry and workplace segregation. Uh, we see Pence posed with white women as teachers and white men as police officers, construction workers, and businessmen. While there is some variation on these themes, uh, Pence largely builds a digital world of white gender segregated jobs. These groupings of men illustrate homosocial interactions in the workplace where men interacting at the exclusion of women serves as a way of reinforcing male dominance in the workplace. As women stand to the side or are absent altogether from Pence's workplace images, his digital world illustrates exactly this type of masculine behavior. Uh, Clinton's combines traditional narratives of femininity, such as motherhood, with traditionally masculine behavior, such as authority, illustrating hybridity, the mixing of gender performances. We see her in authoritative positions, such as at the head of a table or commanding a room as she gives a speech. Uh, we also see her in images similar to Pence, interacting in what could be considered homosocial behavior with groups of male workers. But we also see her interacting with women and children uh, far more than we do with either Trump or Pence. Um, discussing Clinton's image and behavior as masculine or feminine feels a little like playing into the sexist narratives that we all saw too much throughout the campaign, alternately criticizing her as being too much or too little of a woman. Um, but this is exactly what we're talking about when we talk about uh, hegemonic masculinity and normative gender. Um, we're not saying that her masculine behavior doesn't belong in her body or that her feminine behavior doesn't fit with her role. Um, it's also not saying that we should even perceive performances of authority as being masculine in the first place. What it does do is show how we've been trained to understand what it means to be a man or a woman based on the societal consequences and rewards. And finally, Kane's images also illustrate a type of hybridity, specifically highlighting the trait of support. Kane is often seen listening, which contradicts the hallmark masculine trait of authority, and particularly listening and positioning himself among groups of women and people of color. More than Pence, and to a degree Clinton and Trump, Kane features women in the workplace. Kane places himself second often, and places his wife as an equal or in the foreground of images. 
Trump is never seen listening while women are speaking, and Kane seldom depicts hyperfeminine women, two ways Kane appears as the masculine counter to Trump. So now that we've looked at a possible range of narratives, what does this range mean? Clinton and Kane's moments of gen mixing gendered performances are promising signs that space may be growing uh, in presidential politics for non-normative masculinities and relatedly femininities. Um, it's not insignificant that ch children of any gender get to see slight variations on the type of masculinity required to reach the level of presidential politics. Um, but we have to keep in mind that these differences are slight uh, and think about what traits and identities their commonalities exclude. All four are white, cisgender, heterosexual, and have a gender normative presentation of professional dress. While it's important to note the different forms masculinity takes in their digital presentations, because we so often ignore subtle differences and note the glaring omissions in images, um, we have to remember that even the most promising narratives of masculinity at the level of presidential politics today still fall within a narrow range bounded by race, class, sexuality, and a range of other social markers. These narratives are carefully curated to include and exclude all of the traits I've discussed. Instagram images of Trump are not documentations of a hypermasculine man in the physical world, but constructions of a hypermasculine figure in the digital world. Instagram images of Kane as a supportive listener are not documentations of a supportive listener in the physical world, but constructions of this narrative of masculinity as its own digital reality. Uh, William Mitchell conceives of the networked world as a digital, digital double of our own, and while it does not exist as a digital replica, it serves as a space for us to use these constructed realities to negotiate what it means to be powerful, to be a man by the standards society rewards, and what the consequences are of even the slightest violations of standards of normative gender in America. What we learn and promote online influences how we act in our physical realities. And this loop of the creation of meaning influences how we vote, how we resist, and how we understand power and inequality among ourselves. Moving forward in an era where social networks are central to the new administration's communication strategy, much of our attention will be directed at what politicians are saying online, and perhaps whether we have photographic documentation as a means of backing up their claims. In the urgency of these moments, it is important that we not forget the subtleties of the more mundane images, the way these are patterned, and how our cultural perceptions of gender, race, class, and other social identities, as well as the politicians themselves, are constantly being constructed through the persistent means of digital images. I just want to close um, with a quote from John Fisk. Um, Whatever else a figure is, it is always a body of discourse, a point where circulating meanings are made visibly and audibly public, where they are energized and their momentum increased. As nouns, figures are the sites of circulation and contestation. As verbs, they are agents in the process, and they are always both. Hi, I'm Josie Newey. I'm from Texas A&M, and today I'll be presenting something that's not methodologically about a specific set of data, but more drawing from the literature to draw comparisons and critique a certain theory. So in doing this, my title is Dylan Roof, Trolling and, and Tweeting While White, The Psychological Wage of Whiteness Online. I'd just like to provide kind of a context. I'm connecting theories um, and experiences um, and kind of observations of reality that people could find triggering, um, mainly because of their own experiences that are in their lived realities. So that's my trigger warning. For anybody that's listening, and I'm talking about whiteness, 
So that problematizes reality for a lot of us. Um, kind of my main points, um, the theory that I'm kind of aiming to contribute to is called the social identity model of de-individualization. It's kind of called side theory. Basically, it's the commenter kind of phenomenon. Don't read the comments. Why? Because it's about anonymity and what you expect people will say in an anonymous environment. That's kind of how I frame the theory to my mother when she asks. Um, <laughs> to kind of situate this theory, I'm not um, aiming to completely dismantle it, but yet kind of reveal more social context and what we can also, when we look at this theory and test this theory, what else can we test with it? Because it's often tested alone. So it's you um, kind of set somebody in front of a computer, they know the, they are given individual markers of the other person, a picture, a name, something that allows it kind of to give that person context um, and then looks at opinions and how they shift if you take those individual markers away. Um, and also kind of along with the psychological wage of whiteness, I'll be describing backstage racism, which is um, described in this book, which is built on Goffman's idea of a front stage and a backstage and that, like the previous presenter talked about, gendered personas and performances. And as part of this, um, talking about gendered performances and racial performances, I'll be bringing in masculinity, which is developed by Connell. So side theory. As I said, it's kind of like, don't read the comments. Um, so individualization, identifying someone as a person, perception of users as individuals. So when you're online, whether you perceive someone as just a member of a group or as an individual, this theory argues you will have less or more civil like language used towards them. Um, De-individualization, the perceptions of users as part of one single identity group. Um, and as part of this theory, they argue that when you perceive someone as part of a group, um, your opinions become polarized. So if you're liberal and talking to a conservative and you just see them as a conservative, you don't want them to change your views. So that's called bipolarization. But if you see someone as an individual with different traits and various opinions, you might your opinions might kind of, quote, converge together. And as part of this theory um, developed, it's also <laughs> in the theory and in the articles, it's, quote, natural for people to socially differentiate each other. And I'm deconstructing that naturalness and talking about the socialization of individuals that were actually socialized, that even though whether or not you want to believe social differentiation is natural, how it um, permeates online and in offline reality is actually quite socialized in a way and constructed. So here we see like seeing someone as me and you and then going to the shift, us versus them kind of that type of behavior. So what can we add to side theory and what can we add to um, testing it, specifically in online real life spaces? Because side, side theory is often tested in a controlled environment, two different groups, um, where actually users aren't even allowed to interact in some of the experiments. They're given um, kind of pre-tested, somebody responds, they think somebody is responding, but it's kind of part of a script. And so talking about racialized and gendered performances, which we saw in presidential elections this year, very much so, um, the content and postings, side theory and those who use it have said, yes, we need to look at content of postings, but that also relates to in the intent of users. So are users going online to become, quote, more well-informed, or are users going online to make an argument, or to, quote, communicate with others. All of these are actually testable and have been tested in computer-mediated behavior studies, and they affect what you're most likely to share if you actually identify your intent to going online. Place and time, so you can test um, kind of what we've talked about, certain platforms are racialized gendered spaces in a lot of ways. Um, and within those platforms, there's other spaces that are racialized and gendered. 
you can reference these through hashtags like Black Twitter, the Facebook pages you like, um, kind of all of those spaces are in some way you know what you're getting into when you like something. Um, and then also talking about uh, opinion leaders online. So considering there's a structure, so somebody just doesn't go online and then decide to become a troll, um, kind of <laughs> Leslie Jones and Gamergate and the fappening, all of these actually point to a structure that's online and opinion leaders are part of this structure and should be considered rather than, oh, a troll is just one person, there's a network and structure that contributes to the behavior that side theory doesn't necessarily account for. Um, I would also like to kind of, when we think about online spaces, um, not kind of look at them outside of offline behavior. So Twitter doesn't cause revolutions. Um, I think we've kind of identified there's social context Ferguson, you can read the report and understand the social context. Why were people mad in Ferguson? Um, and also, de-individualization isn't caused by getting in front of a computer. So there's a choice, although um, people would like to think of it as natural. Oh, the internet created trolls. Okay, well, <laughs> um, I would kind of um, drawing on other theories, we can give m better context to the offline behavior that maybe is online now and kind of participation in that. Um, and as part of this, um, kind of the internet is thought of in a lot of different ways as part of embodiment. So fear of missing out, that's an emotional response to going online. I've identified it in myself, it's fine. I'm in a 12-step process. Um, and embodiment of online things. Um, people see sometimes the internet as unemotional. Oh, you go online to dis you know, disconnect from the world. But actually, offline and online behaviors are emotional. And going online, of course, in many ways when you think about it, is an embodiment. So if somebody says the N-word online, perception of that varies. And so you're not leaving your body when you go online, but actually re-inhibiting more emotional ways of looking at it. So if you see someone else getting married on Facebook, you do have an emotional response to that. And so rather than theorizing something, oh, trolls become an us versus them, that actually is a very emotional response people have and not um, saying the internet is a void of emotion but kind of a different embodiment of it and sometimes reflects offline reality and sometimes kind of um, misinterprets offline reality. So what am I talking about when I say the psychological wage of whiteness? I'm actually drawing from W.E.B. Du Bois, who um, coined the phrase, and it was in a specific historical time period, after Reconstruction in the United States, that the psychological wage of whiteness is essentially a system of benefits that were sold to whites so they would not, to specifically white laborers, so they would not organize with black workers. And it was sold to them by elites, saying, if you don't organize with black laborers, then we'll give you a system of advantages. And Du Bois argued that this system of advantages was actually per, um, perpetuated in many ways. Funding for white schools, um, segregation, but also through kind of public rhetoric. So whites were like talked about, instrumentalized in the media in positive ways, and then whenever blacks or the black population was brought up, it was in negative ways. And so we see this interaction between these two things, and what I'm arguing is the psychological wage of whiteness is being waged online. So if you think of like Milo, and I can never pronounce his last name, anybody? Milo? Yeah, a little, yep. And, um, through other opinion leaders online, of course, this construction of reality, quote, Mexicans are rapists, kind of a famous quote from the election, um, that is also saying others are not, right? So those are those rapists over there, but we are also not that. When you say, also locker room talk, oh, we all 
You know, oh, that's just locker room talk. That's talking about a specific time and place. Those, those things happen in the locker room. So that's not online. That's not on 4chan. That's in a physical embodied space that often represents hegemonic masculinity. And if you think of sexual assault as a historical phenomenon, um, I don't think you'd get a black man saying, yes, you can get away with anything if you're rich, because um, sexual assault hasn't historically developed like that. Um, so that's kind of Du Bois's concept. Um, talking about the emotional framing, um, it can be thought of one of um, kind of racism and race and ethnic theories is the white racial frame which argues that racism is part of a worldview and part of that worldview is emotions and is based off of Goffman's idea of front stage and backstage. So kind of when we think of de-individualization or going online to do things, we can think of sincere fictions. And so what's that concept? It's kind of the concept of racial superiority. You may, some may believe that racial superiority is based on biology. Um, and actually this is perpetuated in many ways by saying, you know, oh, black men are just better able to jump. So looking at that biological nature of race, but these sincere fictions at certain historical periods kind of develop in response. So if you think of, um, we want to take America back or make America great again, there's an implied ideology that is kind of perpetuated that similar to after reconstruction is about reclaiming uh, a nation and a space as part of whiteness and masculinity. Um, and these are kind of sincere fictions that are performed online. And um, these sincere fictions are actually also gendered because if you look at Jesse Daniels work on cyber racism, when people go on Stormfront, women, and want to participate in white supremacist groups, they often then form white only or female only white supremacist chat spaces. So they're recognizing that they want a space away from sexism, but they just want to perform a different type of racism, specifically about abortion and women's rights but clearly white women's rights. So um, it's part of intersectionality, looking at those connections, um, but also looking at how they're performed. And these can also, these spaces can be constructed with hashtags. Um, Gamergate is an example of kind of collective behavior rather than thinking of that one racist uncle that you have, thinking of it, racism is more of a collective behavior that you actually need affirmed and during historical periods that you don't think you have racial hegemony anymore. Um, or you don't think that male hegemony is specifically protected. Um, you have to like go online. Whether or not that perception is actually correct can be contested. Um, in many ways, but it's the perception that hegemony is under attack. Um, and part of this, part of this is also, um, there's an article called Trolls Just Want to Have Fun that talks about sadism and trolling uh, that actually links sadistic uh, personality traits to trolling. So not that I really generally like the headline. It does describe that trolls, it is an emotional outlet. So they're looking to embody something online. Um, and this is kind of through studies, although the kind of condensed and kind of there's not many of them because the internet studies have kind of just developed. Um, it's important to look at intent and kind of how those uh, kind of combining all of these studies to kind of describe this behavior online. Um, I don't want to say that the internet is all of one thing or all of another. The Occupy movement show that when you go online with the intent of finding new information, you become a better citizen in many ways. And so I think it's important to look at that intent and kind of look at de-individualization in different contexts. Um, and so why people go on Twitter to find news, to find new information is part of kind of looking at trolling as a behavior and as a choice rather than a natural phenomenon. Um, also, when we think of communication networks, you can actually look at convergence of opinions and what people perceive 
um, that people will accept. And there's a wonderful article that uh, looks at if you're looking to communicate and with friends online on Facebook, you're more likely in this study to um, like perceive that people want to hear like in egalitarian messages. So you want to stay friends with people and you perceive those people as racist or sexist. So you're going to like that or share that information. Um, and then also side theory has been disproven by looking at YouTube and Facebook in one study. There weren't more uncivil messages on YouTube um, versus Facebook. There is the same amount. So in some spaces, you're perceiving social cues in a more aptitude way that maybe you're, you believe your social network may perceive something in a certain way. Um, these are many of my sources because I'm a sociologist, so I stand on the shoulders of giants and these are those giants. Hi. Um, as alluded to, I'm quite dismayed by the font debacle, um, but the show must go on. Um, and another uh, slight preface, the original paper that I'd submitted was about uh, cybernetics and Dadaism, and it had the same title of Dada Data, which is on the program. Uh, it was a lot more technology-centric, but in getting placed on a panel that's about populism um, and the election, to some degree, I decided to rewrite the paper entirely while retaining my clever alliteration. So this is a sort of very different paper and it's sort of a weird paper, but um, I don't know, I think it actually fits more than I thought it would with what was just presented. So, uh, much ado has been made of the so-called fake news and post-truth politics over the last 18 months or so. The ambiguous concept of meaning is perhaps integral to both to, to this phenomena, um, which if you listen to liberal punditry has been ostensibly rendered null and void. While I don't intend to relitigate the 2016 election on moral grounds, per se, I am interested in the implication of meaninglessness that is heralded as both a cause and a symptom of some mutated strain of populism. Uh, I intend to trace a sort of speculative roadmap between the radical avant-garde art movement Dada, inaugurated exactly 100 years ago, uh, and the zealotry surrounding data science that props up contemporary uh, notions of technocracy or technocratic ideology. The importance of the latter, of course, should not fall on deaf ears to anyone that paid paid close attention to the electoral strategy uh, on both sides of the ticket last year, but especially so with the Clinton organization. So in 1975, the cultural critic Henri Lefebvre wrote, to the degree that modernity has a meaning, it is this. It carries within itself from the beginning a radical negation, Dada. The avant-garde movement sought to reclaim an autonomy that they felt had been snatched away from them by the progressively mechanized and automated and commodified nature of society uh, just following the turn of the century. Modernizing the radical praxis of Luddism, the Dadaists were hell-bent on voiding from culture the increasingly prevalent and decreasingly abstract raw material that powered the engines of modern capitalism, quantified information, which in the other paper is my lead up, my on-ramp to the concept of cybernetics. But for this context here, it maybe is a sort of a, another on-ramp to event, the eventual science of data. Um, like the Luddite workers who literally threw wrenches into factory gears to halt production, the Dadaists erratically injected noise into the cultural information system, aiming to render meaningless what they perceived as the bourgeois co-optation of everyday life and art and politics. A dogmatic principle of radical negation was indeed uncharted territory. Attempting to undermine the very idea of art itself, Marcel Duchamp uh, infamously exhibited a ready-made urinal, which I'm sure many of you have seen, uh, well, Hugo Ball forewent the strictures of any known language, reciting nonsensical phonemes from the stage of Zurich's Cabaret Voltaire in 1916. Uh, Dada endeavored to dismantle the bourgeois notion that art was in any way superior to everyday life, and incriminating meaningfulness itself along the way was seemed an assured way to do exactly that. So, uh, one piece by Raoul Hausmann, a prominent Dadaist, uh, I think is particularly useful in illustrating the ongoing societal change that Dadaists were intent on resisting. 
This is that piece. Uh, it's entitled, A Bourgeois Precision Brain Incites a World Movement. Hausman utilized the signature Dada technique of cut-up or photo montage, which at the time was a truly evocative and I guess controversial technique. Splicing together found images from the taxonomical, from taxonomical anatomy charts, which is kind of in the back, uh, some machinic components that resemble sausage grinders, and a couple sort of ominous and seemingly upper-class uh, figures in the background surveying the scene. Uh, the piece appears to forewarn against the villain that Lefebvre eventually deemed the, quote, cybernanthrope. Uh, and the cybernanthrope was the anti-humanist incarnate, a reviled man as machine, the air-conditioned official obsessed with information systems, with scientific rationality, and with classification and control. Uh, another piece of Hausman's, seen here, uh, is an assemblage of measurement devices and technological apparatuses entitled Holtzkopf, which translates uh, variably as wooden head or mechanical head. And this seems to further cement the polemical tenet of his work, combating the onset of a primitive information age of quantified selves and optimized biotechnologies. Uh, the Dadaists had lost, lost confidence in an increasingly mechanized culture, and as stated by the artist Marcel Janco, they felt they had only one choice. Quote, Everything had to be demolished. We would begin again by shocking the bourgeois, attacking common sense, public opinion, education, institutions, good taste, the whole prevailing order. Now, if this drawn-out preamble on Dadaism has felt slightly astray, given the topic of this panel, I hope this Janko quote might begin to snap things into focus. A certain candidate uh, in last year's election seems to be situated in a sort of bizarre harmony with the century-old avant-garde that was so fixated on disrupting the status quo. And perhaps a certain other candidate uh, sounds oddly reminiscent of Dada's mortal enemy, the technocratic cybernanthrope. <laughs> to remove any remaining ambiguity, which I not sure exists. Uh, I'll just offer this fun fact that I stumbled upon in my research, which probably doesn't merit much of a close reading, but is, uh, props up my point nonetheless. Hans Richter, a prolific Dadaist himself, uh, referred to several of the more ferociously political members of Club Dada at one point in one of the Dadaist, Dadaist journals. Uh, and he was referring here to, among others, Hausman, who was we just saw a couple pieces of. Um, he referred to Hausman and Co. as a sort of brass section in the figurative Dadaist orchestra. This brass, brass section, he said, brazenly sounded repeated blasts on their quote, Trump of Doom. <laughs> All right. Um, my cards are now on the table. Uh, and I, at this point, I'd like to weave into the story the question of data and then eventually return to the question of meaning as weaponized by Dada. Uh, over the past week or so, I've gone back and reread a handful of exuberantly optimistic pre-election articles on the data strategy deployed by the Clinton campaign. That's the right response. Uh, following Obama's lead, the Clinton campaign allocated unprecedented resources to build an absolutely state-of-the-art analytics team staffed by technologists, statisticians, data scientists, and pollsters. This led to a center stage starring role in the campaign for ADA. Uh, Ada is an omnipotent algorithm named after the fi famous pioneer of computation, Ada Lovelace. And according to campaign manager Robbie Mook, Ada, quote, guided almost every aspect of what we do. Running over 400, sim four, excuse me, 400,000 simulations a day, the system seemed airtight and campaign leaders obeyed this algorithmic oracle uh, on decisions regarding ground game geography, distribution of advertising funds, and even social media strategy. Uh, unfortunately, and as several or more, probably more than several, a lot of critics and, uh, critics and pundits alike have pointed out at this point, Ada was ultimately vexed by a combination of overfitting in the data science sense, as well as the evergreen commandment, garbage in, garbage out. The garbage in part of that phrase refers here, of course, to the immense troves of historical statistical evidence from previous elections uh, and ongoing internal polling data that was being tabulated in real time. In an election season marred by innumerable firsts and never befores, uh, it now feels palpable that all the data in the world may still have proven inept when confronted with the spirit of reactive disruption that took the electric, electorate by storm. Uh, of course, I'm well aware that the Cl Clinton won the popular vote, but the unfortunate primacy of the Electoral College is no secret. And Ada's utter failure to direct any resources to Wisconsin, among other things, ultimately proved fatal. Holding an autonomous algorithm accountable is a relatively newfound dilemma with no clear p ethical or political answers. However, when Wisconsin's field team of real humans, I might note, uh, is nervously clamoring for materials like yard signs and campaign literature, and the requests are completely dismissed out of hand by headquarters because they don't quite align with Ada's divinations, 
Perhaps something more profound is afoot. As Politico put it, Clinton and co. Uh, uncritically wielded Ada, beautiful Ada, uh, to wage a campaign, quote, more mathematical than inspirational. Um, on the other side of the ticket, Trump had seemingly resurrected our friend Hugo Ball, also foregoing the strictures of any known language, reciting nonsensical phonemes from stage, <laughs> this time not Cabaret, Cabaret Voltaire, but Mohegan Sonorina. Uh, I'm being slightly reductionist here, admittedly, but I think a similar pursuit to infuse meaninglessness through a flippant rejection of the dominant norms of politics and culture reflects an epochal nihilism that underpins both Dadaist and Trumpist dogma. Uh, I'm going to quote at length Raoul Van Vinegem, uh, who is a prominent member of the Situationist International, who is 1960s Parisian neo dadaist troop movement, um, as I think he presciently foreshadows the crucial strategic distinction at the heart of the 2016 election. Quote, information theory straightaway ignores the chief power of language, which lies on its poetic level, to combat and to supersede. A writing that approaches emptiness can only be deployed in accordance with a mathematical experimentation. Despite the magnificent hypothesis of a quote, or he's referring here to some cybernetics, cybernetics thinkers at the time who he was very, he wasn't, he wasn't friends with, let's say. Um, the, despite the magnificent hypothesis of a quote, poetics of information, the technologians of language will never understand anything but the language of technology. So where, end quote, whereas Clinton deployed mathematical experimentation, Trump perhaps unwittingly evoked the specter of a vulgar poetics rife with the capacity to, quote, combat and supersede the existing order. Clinton's rhetoric, which merely approached emptiness, approached being the key point of my argument, was entirely usurped by a bombastic espousal of pure emptiness, of pure negation. Uh, this may sound a bit counterintuitive insofar as it seems to prize the notion of emptiness, but uh, the political theorist Ernesto Laclau, Laclau excuse me, uh, has written at length on the latent political power of what he deemed empty signifiers. Considering the process of signification itself, which semiotics methodically entangled with the concept of meaning, what might we, what might we make of the fact that the Clinton analytics team in uh, campaign headquarters above the analytics wing of the office uh, had a, a big banner emblazoned with the mantra, statistically significant. Uh, such an assertion uh, that the banner was making and the team was making uh, echoes forebodingly Van Eigem's declaration that the technologians of language will never understand anything but the language of technology. Uh, so in this work on empty signifiers, LeCloud dwells on precisely this type of technocratic language claiming that it is fundamentally underwritten by its own prescribed limits of signification, yet remains oblivious to this fact. Um, hobbled by the dregs of Wittgenstein, the limits of sign signification must therefore inherently both shape and reflect the limits of politics itself. But of course, this is a paradoxical situation, as the very existence of a limit necessarily implies that something remains just out of, out of reach or just beyond that limit. Uh, in punditry jargon, the Overton window is a democratic norm that Im implicitly regulates what is on and off limits in political discourse. And likewise, it necessarily presupposes a lexicon that enticingly exists just apart from any allegiance to the normative constraints of decency or veracity. Uh, according to LeClau, this semiotic paradox leads unavoidably to the creation of empty signifiers, which he says blur the boundaries of a totalizing system and constitute quote, the pure threat of negation that lies dormant in every political environment. In fact, the practice of politics itself, he asserts, and this is important, is the very process of harnessing these empty signifiers. Oh, too far. Okay, so the empty signifiers here, I changed this this week. I don't know if anyone, rec anyone recognizes what this still is from. A certain Pepsi ad that we all just watched in shock and awe. Um, and I don't, you probably can't make it out, but I'm sure you've all seen it as given the response. Um, these empty signifiers that LeCloud is referring to are exactly things like unity and conversation and peace and, you know, and essentially anything, even America itself. Um, and so, importantly, LeCloud asserts that the process of politics itself is, is the process of harnessing these empty signifiers and then hegemonically refilling their meaningfulness only for them to be emptied, again, vis-a-vis -vis political struggle, but then subsequently refilled. Signification remains ever in flux. The Im implication here being that democratic p politics is, and has, has always been, both a post-truth and perhaps a pre-truth battle for meaning. Uh, LeClau ends his essay with a provocation that seems to be quite harmonious with our current moment. 
Quote, as society changes over time, this process will always be precarious and reversible, and different projects or wills will try to hegemonize the empty signifiers of the absent community. The recognition of the constitutive nature of this gap of this gap and its political institutionalization is the starting point of modern democracy. Uh, so the absent community that Laclau refers to thus mercilessly demands recognition, lofting sheer invective of the semiotic, affective, or even physical variety in the direction of the ruling class. This antagonistic other that populism rises up against within Laclau's theoretical framework uh, arguably found its perfect embodiment in the what I'm going to refer to as the Clintonian cybernanthrope. Uh, likewise, the Clinton campaign's uncritical devotion to Ada, perhaps the consummate prototype of Hausman's dreaded bourgeois precision brain, starkly lays bare the technocrat's Achilles heel, uh, which I would argue is a tacit aversion to the messy to messy democracy in favor of a sterilized and depoliticized bureaucratic best practices and optimized what works pragmatism, whatever those things might mean. Uh, and so to conclude, in 1919, Tristan Zara, proclaimed in one of the many manifestos of the movement, quote, Dada signifies nothing. Operating under the aegis of an equally nihilistic credo, perhaps, is an unsurprising, or sorry, operating under the aegis of an equally nihilistic credo, perhaps it is unsurprising that large swaths of the alt-right faction are increasingly abandoning the infamous red pill and embracing instead a so-called black pill ethos. According to a prominent Dark Enlightenment blog, the first tenet for those who have chosen the black, pill, black pill is, quote, nothing means anything. Uh, this reactionary nihilism may purport to validate and sustain a world devoid of meaning, but as the chief situationist himself, Guy Debord, retrospectively surmised, Dadaism's political project of unbridled negation ultimately and irreparably sowed the seeds of both its triumph and its ruin. Once the bankruptcy of bourgeois technocracy had been effectively exposed, the Dadaist avant-garde was able to offer precisely zero utopian alternatives to fill that void. And so they quickly withered in impotence through the 1920s. Indeed, such a program of peer negation necessarily forecloses on the non-deterministic futurity that is the crux of a positive interpretation of Laclau's politics of empty signification as might be best illustrated by Trump's electoral success and subsequent legislative incompetence. Uh, and I'll return to Henri Lefebvre with a one final quote, who offers what might be repurposed as a vitalizing, or sorry, a revitalizing call to arms uh, towards a, maybe what I would argue, a generative politics of solidarity or even a speculative populism of affirmation as opposed to negation. Lest we fall prey once again to the depoliticized siren song of Ada's technocracy. Quote, Dada smashes the world, but the pieces are fine. Thanks. Okay, thank you all so much. Um, we're gonna take questions now, but I'm gonna start with one. Um, I'm interested in how the election or the current presidency has um, affected all of your work, how it sort of made you see things differently or interested in, in um, pursuing different subjects. Um. Um, no, 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 no. Um, just give me a minute to collect my thoughts. I think, um, I think the election is part of like a larger historical trend that I've kind of recognized and am interested in looking at as um, kind of giving more social context or thinking of the psychological wage of whiteness defined by Du Bois as a Weberian ideal type, which means looking at when will the wage of whiteness wage itself and thinking of the historical context of the perception of that economic that economic mobility of a group is under kind of um, is kind of under attack and so when we think of hegemonic masculinity we know that somebody has to be at the top every one man has to be the man's man but also thinking of racial superiority perceived as contested and so maybe looking at the election and what does it mean to take back America um, as part of a context of thinking that within collective behavior um, and analyzing that. 
Um, I think for me, um, a, a lot of it's kind of, well, the purpose of my presentation was looking at um, nuance in the sort of everyday mundane things. Um, because I realized at some point in the election, as, as we all did, everything everything feels like a source of outrage, right? So every single day, there's, we're just bombarded with so many things to be outraged about or to be scared of. Um, and that gets exhausting, first of all, but also there's, it made me think about all the things we're missing when we only focus on those things. So even though there's, you know, there's huge gross instances of racism, of xenophobia, of sexism, there's also, you know, there's microaggressions, there's, there's just everyday racism and everyday sexism and everyday xenophobia. And these things are happening at all kinds of levels and at the levels that we just don't even have time to think about or to address because we're just so bombarded with things to be furious about all the time. So um, to sum it up, I, it's, it's made me in my own work want to try to think a, think a little bit more about the, the small stuff. Yeah. Um, probably a totally uncontroversial answer for a crowd like this, but I think, and probably, I mean, I would imagine that a lot of us were probably already in this frame of mind prior to this election, but I think researching technology, um, maybe makes it slightly easy to sort of like ignore politics or something. I mean, I think everyone here would probably disagree with that. And that's kind of the point of a conference like this, but I think it, and maybe, I don't know, maybe the exercise of rewriting this paper through a, like, specifically political lens was useful and, and a good example of what you're talking about. It's like, I think that it's important to, I mean, it's not important to, it's sort of unavoidable to now reframe anything you're thinking about or working on through, I guess, the moment we're living in or through, or, I don't know. I don't know, that's not really a good answer, but. I'm going to take questions from you all now, and also if you are watching or listening from home, pose a question to the hashtag TTW17, and I'll try to see it. Um, but does anyone in the audience have a question? Yes. Uh, I'm just curious, like, how uh, you guys have any thoughts on uh, the sort of uh, the strategy Trump employed, or supposedly Trump employed, according to Cambridge Analytica, saying that they personalized messages using psychometrics. And you know what implications, whether it's snake oil or true, what implications it has for sort of the use of data and sort of the future of data. I'm just going to restate the questions <laughs> so that people who are listening can hear them. The question is, if I have it right, what do the panelists think about the idea of Cambridge Analytics using, um, like, collecting data about people and, and sort of targeting um, political messages to them on the Internet? Um, you, yeah, you mentioned the psychometrics that seems to be core, like key to the Cambridge Anal Analytica program. Um, I, I, don't, I didn't think I mentioned this, but uh, Dadaism was also very closely intertwined with some sort of like bizarro mysticism. So I think it's not surprising that, I mean, I guess the other point that I should make in case people haven't seen the reporting, but like, I think it's come out that the Trump campaign actually didn't rely on what Cambridge Al Analytica was doing all that much. Like they were paying some money for it and there was some kind of relationship, but people have speculated that, that existed because Bannon was on bo the board of the company or something, but they, they, there was not actually all that much. Um, I mean, to the extent that the Clinton campaign was like, you know, following Ada's orders, if you want to anthropomorphize it like that. Um, it kind of seems like the on the Trump side, they weren't quite doing the same thing. And so I think maybe like, maybe that weird mysticism or like snake oil thing further connects it to Dadaism in a weird way, but I don't know. I mean, I don't know enough about what Trump did or didn't do behind the scenes. Um, kind of not to like generally talk about like what Trump's, whether they were following an analytic software or not. Um, I think it's really interesting for a lot of, um, ways for people to respond to Trump's campaign to say, oh, he's very ignorant and that, and just end it there. But I think it's more interesting to think of Trump's fan, Trump's campaign and his continuous like strategy as willful ignorance as a political strategy, um, kind of looking at um, what he's saying, that he's trying to come off as authentic, which means something, that authenticity, that n 
whatever that authenticity is, it's actually inherently contradictory. He'll say one thing and then do another thing, and people see authenticity in that. Um, and this is kind of interesting to study as a political strategy, but also as a way of saying um, whatever Trump says is locker room talk or what we all say. Um, I've heard that also said about Trump's election. He says what we're thinking. Okay, well, that's true, but maybe we should interrogate what we're thinking and why we're thinking that way. Uh, I'm curious, all of you obviously think a lot about partisanship and politics on the internet, and all of us know, now more than ever, how uh, segmented and kind of self-selecting uh, that becomes. I'm wondering if in your research you've come across spaces on the internet that you feel like are prime for uh, like a more nuanced and critical discussion that inter you know, that that allows space for different viewpoints more broadly. You know, like are there any bright spots? The question is about spaces online that are less politically polarized um, or offer more space for um, sort of political, cross-political conversation. Um, no, I haven't. Um, yeah, I, so off the top of my head, no, I can't think of any and also I didn't come across any of my research but um, it's also hard for me to answer that question coming off of my research because I try and this this was very hard because I do have my own political leanings but I, I tried as much as possible in doing my research for this project in trying to sort of not pay attention to those spaces I mean I, I go on my own Facebook account and I see all kinds of you know factions of my family that hold certain views that I don't want to see and I see groups of friends who are a little bit more like-minded and so I'm certainly aware that these divisions exist but um but yeah so I I tried to avoid it in my own research and I'm I don't have a message of optimism I'm sorry um yeah I don't really either I guess um in a lot of ways I mean, I think that there's kind of convergences of things that you wouldn't expect, like um, the hashtag on Twitter, BCOT, Black Conservatives on Twitter, or some other hashtags in communities that you might think of, oh, I wouldn't think that would happen, but it does. Um, I think it's also helpful to point out that communities aren't as polarized as the media wants you to think they are. And specifically, my master's paper is on Ferguson, and the mo a month of Twitter data coming from that. Not that I looked at all that much because there was 8 million tweets and I'm only one researcher, but um, I looked at what was retweeted um, and I wanted to test side theory and actually I could have, um, but since most of the tweets on Twitter right after Ferguson were anti-racist, I said, oh, I can't, like side theory is used to test racism, but actually it disproved side theory because if you think of yourself as a member of a group and you think that somebody was shot because they're a member of a, a specific group what wouldn't <laughs> what is a better motivator for de-individualization and stereotyping of another group than um somebody's body left in the street and that actually the things that were retweeted on twitter were we want to trust police um but we're they're losing our trust and so, especially right after and the interactions with police, that it's seen actually in an investment in police. And actually, if you look at the data from the civil rights movement, there is an investment in police structures in many surveys. They want police, but they want to evaluate how they interact with others in a critical way. I mean, one of the interesting things I've seen <laughs> personally is that Products that are um, marketed as trying to help people like break out of their political filter bubble often do that by like taking out the conversation part. So there are these products that are like uh, about uh, informing you about what's going on uh, in the right wing media, but they're written by a left leaning person who is sort of like your ambassador in that world. So you don't actually have to go there. Or I don't know if you've seen 
this feature on BuzzFeed that they introduced recently. I think it's it has some bubble related name. Uh, but what they do is that they curate different perspectives on the piece from around the internet and from their own like Facebook comment section. And then they rewrite them in these like hyper rational lines. So um, they'll you know, they'll like take a comment that's kind of heated and they'll rewrite it. So when you read it, you're not like instantly offended. And then you can like click through and see the actual comment if you want to. And so, I mean, I haven't actually seen anybody sort of trying to do that in a way that actually gets people talking with each other. It seems more a way to like prevent people from talking to each other, but allow them to understand what somebody else is thinking. Anyway, yes. The three of you talked about technology and its relation to politics, but I could see that um, in two of the cases, uh, technology was basically talked about as a vehicle or a medium or um, a communication channel. And in another, uh, it was mostly about this omnipotent, kind of like omniscient, um, sort of like authority or kind of like technology as an entity that has a lot of agency. Um, I guess my question is, when you think about technology and politics, um, how much do you sort of like go back and forth between what through what lens? How do you think about technology and how how do you think that these interrelate to one another? I hope that question is clear. I'm going to try to restate it and then you okay, can Okay, thank tell you. Me. Um, so the question is about uh, whether you see technology as like a channel for information or as um, something with its own authority uh, or and how that informs your research and sort of affects the way that you understand politics and technology. Um, so I didn't talk about it in my paper at all, but Trump obviously utilized technology as well. Um, and I think maybe this is a good opportunity to sort of introduce the what, what, what was the thesis of the previous paper that I didn't present. Um, actually, not really the thesis, but the sort of like the political code to it that if I wanted to apply it to the election, what I would have done. Um, it was about cybernetics, which I think is a precursor in a lot of ways to our technological moment. Um, and the point of that paper was that basically to sort of summarize, I guess, the, the main tenets of the three specific orders of cybernetics that kind of came consecutively. Um, and I think the, the political ang or the political lens through which to view this is that first order, first order, or excuse me, first order cybernetics. Um, basically took these technological systems as like closed circuits, like hermetic things that they could only observe from the outside, which maybe goes towards your like, or I mean, what, what you were saying about my paper as this sort of like omnipotent authoritative thing. Second order cybernetics was like, whoa, wait, wait, we're part of this system also. How can we observe ourselves within it? And so one might argue that Trump observed himself within the system by, in, as I kind of alluded to, like injecting a lot of noise, like this, his, sig you know, his noise to signal ratio was you know, unprecedented, let's say. Um, but also, he, you know, unlike tr unlike Clinton, he was going to where his crowds were and having these huge events. And she was, you know, she did the same thing. But I think they did it. They did it. They did these two things in different, fairly different ways. Um, and then the third order cybernetics, which never really took off for good reason, um, but kind of gets at where this paper started to, I don't know, dwell on this these topics. Um, was this this guy Donald McKay in the in the UK um, who basically wanted to inject meaning back into information theory, um, which is a very difficult, difficult thing to quantify meaning. Um, and that's what he, his, his entire cybernetic project intended to do. Um, but it didn't work for any number of reasons. Um, but part of the argument of that non-existent paper was going to just be that if Clinton was first order, Trump is second order, how do we achieve a third order that can sort of like reinstate meaning? Although I think this paper kind of made the argument that like meaning doesn't really matter it's always it's always in flux it's you know so i don't know if that answered your question it's kind of a selfish way to talk about my other paper but <laughs> um well first of all i'll start by saying that uh technology has agency digital worlds have agency and um in my project i was i i, I think that it could come across as looking at um, technology uh, purely as a channel for communication, but uh, that couldn't be further from the truth. Um, I, I look at digital worlds as completely being worlds of their own. And um, 
How many, has anyone met any of the candidates uh, for the 2016 election? How, how long did you, how much time did you spend with them? Um, so I'm from Vermont. I've met Bernie Sanders several times, but like not when he was running for president. And a lot before he was running for president, not, like he used to be around a lot and then he wasn't. Yeah. He was yeah. Show up. Now that counts. So you, so for whatever duration of time you spent with Bernie Sanders, that's that's you knowing Bernie Sanders in the in the physical world, right? So for the rest of us, I didn't see any other hands. For everyone else, we exclusively know these people through digital channels. That's the only way that we know anything about Hillary or or Trump or Pence or Kane, and. Um, that goes beyond communication because it means that none of us really know who they are. I mean, this this goes back to more of an issue of knowledge. How do we really know anything? And if we we think we know who they are, what they stand for, what they do, but we don't. We're we're not there. None of us are with them. We technically have no idea. All we can go off of is the information that they supply us with and sort of the digital worlds that they create. And we do have. You know, there is top-down media, too, where it's not just them creating their own worlds. There's, you know, NBC and Fox and everyone. They're creating these images of the candidates as well. Um, but at the end of the day, I mean, it's kind of a creepy thing to think about. But, you know, what, what do you really know outside of your physical world? Um, so kind of looking at this question, um, whether technology has agency or whether um, these things are just content. Um, I always like to think of when I complained to my mom about losing something and she said, did it get, does it have legs? Did it walk away from you? Um, and so in many ways, when I think about this question, as a sociologist, it makes my head hurt. Um, it kind of makes my mind go in two different directions. And when you, you look at different disciplines, some don't even ask this question and some do, but um, kind of whether or not technology um, has agency, you know, there's a whole studies that have looked at, you know, prototypes as having their own history and facts, but um, kind of it depends on the, because when you think of algorithms and ADA, she was used by the Clinton campaign and then they quote followed her orders, but they kind of gave her that agency. So technology doesn't have legs and run off with itself. Um, it's always kind of situated in different ways, um, just as Google has digital advertisers that like to, in many ways, convert their agency to say, oh, we're just responding to what people want, but what those people are, or what is kind of referred to as the internet, um, is has been given agency, but as actually a filler for another we all know what that means, that the internet um, convinces people of something. They're not saying black Twitter does it. And so I think that technology has agency, but in many ways um, the agency is given in a socially constructed way that's often kind of put over as another way of not thinking about real agency that is given in power dynamics. Out of the 2016 election, I'm seeing an increasing convergence of this idea of like a white tech user who is a strategic genius because of the way they can manipulate media. Um, and not just a, like a regular tech user, but especially in the most like policy context, deep data or whatever, this like, evil genius is controlling whatever. Um, but I'm interested in like in the specific spaces of whiteness that you were looking at in your research, especially from the first two speakers. Um, like what are the ways that this idea of like a tech savvy genius has been complicated? So her question is about this archetype that has emerged uh, in this election of the white tech savvy genius who's sort of like controlling the puppet strings with technology. Um, and she's wondering whether you've come across that archetype or if it's you've seen it sort of your work complicates that idea. Um, yeah, I always um, think of there 
there was a story online, which is kind of how most of my life runs off of stories online, but that there was a user that created like a feminist bot on Twitter. And it would say like, um, kind of dismantling that gender is like a natural or biological phenomenon or saying there's more than two genders, some things that kind of affronted a lot of norms. And then a man presumably white, got in a conversation with a feminist, like a feminist bot, but didn't actually know that it was our fit of artificial intelligence. And then spent, I have, you'll have to look, hours. And then at one point actually hits on the feminist bot. Like, pursues, like, presumes to, like, contradict them and contradict them. And I was like, oh, look at technology has the same experience I do. Wow, that's amazing. Um, <laughs> sorry. Course. And so I think that um, in one way, uh, manipulation of audiences is what Trump did in a lot of ways. Um, is that smart? Is that like showing like a higher intellect? I don't, I, well, it's debatable. I mean, it's successful. Yes. But I think we have to like deconstruct the notion of like, s what does smart mean? Are they tech savvy? I would say yes in a lot of ways, but then in a lot of other ways, they hit on feminist bots, so. Um, I don't, so I'm addressing this mostly because you said that this question was addressed to the, the first two. I don't have the best answer, except to say that this is actually something that my, um, this is an omission in my project. So I, I look at the content of these Instagram galleries as if they were created by a sort of like disembodied figure, um, which is obviously not true. Um, I also sort of look at the content. So it's hard with the content analysis, which is the method I used, because you can't learn anything about motive. Um, you, because I'd just be making assumptions. And so it is hard to tell. Um, what was created by, I mean, presumably they did have the, you know, tech savvy white genius archetype behind these things, but um, I don't know anything about the teams who were, you know, sort of running this. And I also don't know what was created with motive and what, what, what was just accidental. Like, I am sure that there was a ton of strategy that went into all of the content that was created. Um, I'm sure that most of the images and the, you know, any messages about race, class, or gender were absolutely not accidental. But some of it is just the product. I mean, all four of them are white. So that's sort of accidental. If there's a white figure in every picture and it's our white candidate, um, that's not, that's kind of like a, an unavoidable part of all of the candidates that I looked at being white. Um, so yeah, it would, for, for my project specifically, and for me to even really comment on this question, it would just take further research. But it is interesting to think about, um, you know, what, what content we're receiving that's just sort of the product of circumstance and what is being intentionally created and sort of who's pulling the strings behind all of it. And as a quick aside, shockingly, there was a white tech guy behind Ada as well um, named Evan, I think his last name was Kegel, Evan Kegel, who was one of the first people the Clinton team hired and one of the highest paid people on the entire staff that was kind of single-handedly responsible for it. That is all the time we have. Can I have a round of applause for all of our panelists? And thank you all for coming.